famine, fasting, and feasting. It is strange how food and man's uh, relationship to it, whether he has plenty or whether he doesn't have so much, and also in feasting, the conditions within which he consumes that food. God never fails to use something as important as food is to man to make an analogy out of it, to use it in an analogy. And woven through God's Word, there's always been a thing that has I have felt we needed to go further into, and that was the fact there was a demonic being that even the apostles, the disciples at that time, could not cast out. And you'll remember Jesus' words. This kind, this kind, underline kind in your mind, cannot and will not depart without prayer and fasting. That's always troubled me a little bit. I hope that this lecture today alleviates perhaps for us some of the anxieties. Not all of it, because there's still more depth. But we're going to plow a little bit deeper into fasting and food. Is it not ironic that Esau's problems, have you ever stopped to think how many of man's problems are brought about by food? Look at Esau. And then in turn, look at Esau's father. He said, son, I'm old and I'm hungry. Lord, I'm starving. Go out and bring me some venison. And then Esau at the same time comes to his brother and says, I'm starving. Feed me that red uh, stuff you've got in the bowl there. And he became the red nation of today for a bowl of red partage. How strange man is what he will do. Fasting, in a sense, is to take that part of yourself, which is your appetite. Never fail to remember that God uses your appetite of all desires, not only your stomach, and ties them into one. But it is to crucify your appetite that's what fasting is. The word in the Hebrew, sum, or you might say like the English word, sum, it means you're not going to get some. <laughs> it means closing your mouth. All right. Well, closing your mouth can apply in many ways. I've seen a lot of times I would have been a lot better off had I closed my mouth in more ways than one, whether it was food. And I think this is so timely right after the holidays that uh, when we all perhaps, maybe fasting would be a good idea. I'm not recommending fasting, but you understand what I'm saying. It simply means closing your mouth. And of course, with that comes in my mind the words of Job when he saw the awesomeness of God's person, his creation. And he said, oh, Lord, I'll put my hand over my mouth. Well, you see, that was fasting. That's the, that is the word psalm, which is fasting. It means I'll stop, I'll keep my mouth closed, and I'll listen. And then is it not strange that this, through analogy, brought about man's fall? Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Let's begin there, if we may, as we take a little journey through God's Word. You're all so familiar with it, but I want it fresh in your mind. Verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, that's any living creature in the Hebrew. It doesn't mean beast like animals. It means living beings. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat, underline it, there it is, eat of every tree of the garden. Hasn't God told you you can partake of these fruit trees, the apples, the persimmons especially? You know, and uh, to uh, sustain the flesh. Of course God told them they could. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. That is to say, those trees that God has designated as fruit trees. 
But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. I'm not going into the true meaning in the Hebrew. You're all more than familiar with it. But I want you to think of it in the sense of the analogy, hold in your mind the thought of eating, all right? Desire, all right? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Big liar, see? I mean, he lied to her point blank. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good from evil. That old word, enlightenment. And so it goes even to the day through the Illuminati. That's of the lighting, to always turn on more lights. Unfortunately, man, and I will use an analogy at this present time, loses sight and touch with our Father. It's true meaning. Because most, even insert the word apple, as I inserted persimmon. I like persimmon better than apple. That's why I choose to use it, all right? It's, it's more solid. It probably was more close to the truth, closer to the truth. Is the fact that the desire of the flesh, but man is so quick to form preconceived ideas, so very quick to form through peer pressure, preconceived ideas, and then loses sight because he narrows his vision. Each time you presume or assume, you narrow your own vision. You do not analyze the situation to its utmost. You do not take all that God has given you and exercise your mind there within to milk from it all that God has said to you. You might say, well, how in the world now are you going to turn this to where it has anything to do with fasting or with famine or with feasting? Well, God's people are supposed to be feasting, but you're supposed to be feasting on the right thing. And you're supposed to be fasting, but you're supposed to be fasting also from the right thing. And there is going to be a famine, unfortunately, and praise God, you're not going to have anything to do with that. And we're going to go through them. Let's take the first. Uh, let's take an example from a type of Savior, which was Joseph, that had to do with a famine. Ezekiel 37. Turn there for me. Joseph was a type of Christ, inasmuch as all of Israel was would have died had it not been for this one Joseph that his own brother sold him into captivity at the hand and by the hand of Almighty God whereby he would feed his people. He would feed his people during that famine. And you know something? Not only would he feed his people, but he would feed the people of the known world at that time that were involved within this famine. And I want you to see Christ in the same way. Christ feeds his people, but he also feeds the people of the world that will believe uh, upon him. But I want you to see how God takes this truth and maintains it for the wise in his word from the very beginning of the book all the way to the book of Revelation, never changing. The fact that man should be aware of his own self, his own appetite. His appetite can get him in trouble. Now, understand what I'm saying. Don't think I'm talking about your appetite for food only, for uh, all desires, money, love. It doesn't all of them together. They are your greatest temptation when they are combined together while you are in this flesh body. So, there are certain times, again, as forestated, for feasting, for a fast, 
and for a famine. What is a famine? That's what we're about to read of. God uses famine for, if you would, judgment. Judgment is to bring. Hey, if you cut some, if you want, if you try to get somebody's attention, you want them to study or to think more in depth than God's word. Which is the quickest way to get their attention? Cut their food off. <laughs> okay. I don't care what people it is. If you, if they're living high on the hog, if they're man, I mean, they've got everything their hand turns to. They're, it's very difficult to get their attention. But man, if you, you know, if a mother wants her children's attention, just they're not going to play too long. But let supper go by two hours. All right, you'll get their attention. All right. Well, that's the same way our father must do. Our people go past the. Uh, the point of return to the left so far that he has to cut off their food supply to bring them back to these very basics we're talking about. This was what he was about to do. Genesis chapter 37, verse 5. And Joseph, this would have been um, uh, Jacob's favorite son at this time because he had waited all those years to marry this one uh, wife and as she bare this son, he and Benjamin. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Oh, his father was uh, played favorites with him, and how the brothers hated him for this. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were blind, uh, binding sheaves in the field. There you got your food. Boy, we, we were right out there making the harvest. And lo, my sheave arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheave stood round about and made obeisance to my sheave. In other words, we were bundling wheat, and my bundle of wheat stood straight up, and all your, all 11 of them bowed down to mine. Well, you know, that's, uh, that would be um, enough to rise their heckles just a little bit, you see, to make them stop and think. But also, so it would be when their foods... They wouldn't do this under these circumstances where they were living pretty high. They weren't doing too good at taking care of their father's um, uh, sheep, their, his flocks. And uh, Joseph would tell his fathers, they're not, they're not handling the animals the way they should. And he'd keep them in line. They didn't like that. But I'm going to tell you what. When God cuts off their food, they'll be more than willing to bow down to Joseph. For as you all know in this book of, Revel this book of Genesis, it wasn't too many years hence till they all begged for their lives and fell before his feet and loved him. Hey. Now, that, well, I want an analogy here also. As I said, this is a little strung out, and I'm having difficulty, I think, even in teaching this, but I want you to think of that first part, first vision, as an analogy to that present day and even yet today. The vision that is about to be given, though, is yet future to where we are even now, in a sense. But it still says the same thing, only on a higher plane and a higher level of thinking. So open your minds and listen to this vision. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And indeed they did. Nine, here comes the next. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon. I want you to underline those in your mind. The sun and the moon. And I want you to particularly underline moon. And the eleven stars made obeisance to me. This was the zodiac. All signs. But don't forget the moon. For moon is what? Lunar. And what was the type? The kind that could not be cast out without prayer and fasting. Lunatic, which comes from the word lunar, which is demonic in this sense. He said, I even saw that moon bow to me. 
Now, I know, and I'm being a, a student of God's Word, that many commentaries, including my own, have stated this is the father, the mother, and the children. It is. But it also is, has a secondary meaning from the very heavens itself, in the spiritual realm, in the demonic realm even, if you would, when he is that type of Savior. What God is telling you is there is a time coming when, yes, this Savior, or you in his power, can make that moon and its children do obeisance to you. That kind, and that's the only way you're going to do it. Through what? Through Christ. Through the true bread of life. Through the only food there really is in this earth at this time. The food that gives you strength. That gives you foundation on which you can stand without trembling. Every time the wind blows or you hear something from this side of the world or that. When you hear from this part of the zodiac or the other, you are solid on that rock, which is Christ. When you look in the depth at the promises He has made you in the deeper sense from His Word, only through prayer and fasting can you drive out this kind, the Luna, or that lunatic. So we see even in Genesis, yes, the forerunner of this, where did it start? With Satan in the garden where we were talking prior there. It had to do with eat. Though it had to do with the desires in the sexual sense rather than the appetite, it's still the same. And it's extremely important because before we finish this, you will understand that as it started in the beginning, so will the most important part be in the end. Now we have spoken about this one, and the moon, now the sun, how they would make obeisance, obeisance to him. And um, they were extremely, you know the story here, we're going to leave it. They sold him into bondage and he became that savior. He became that one that gave them freedom when their father sent them there. But fasting then set you aside from your appetite of any kind. Do you understand what I mean? You crucify your appetite when you fast. Therefore, it leaves full attention to your Father and His wishes, His Word. Thereby you gain a deeper understanding. That fasting, if you want to do it for your tummy's sake, that's fine, all right? But you'd better do it for your spiritual sake, and it's more important. And that is to say, fast from the false bread that is taught and that is spread, especially in these end times. You had better not partake of it. Do you know how you partake of something? You partake mentally of food given you exactly as your stomach does. Your mind digests that that you take in. The juices of your stomach then break down that, that, you, that food that you intake. Mentally, your mind uh, in meditating breaks down each clause or should of the information and data that is fed into your mind. Uh, when you digest it, you put it to bed. That by putting it to bed, I mean, I speak in the sense of a printer. You seal it in your mind and accept it or accept it as truth or fact to be called upon later, hopefully, for further consideration or to p apply it as knowledge further along in your life as it is needed to consider further. Hopefully, you will never put it to bed as a absolute solid fact unless you know of a certain that it is because this then narrows your vision even so it is with your stomach if you narrow that uh, intake down to certain things and overplay you're going to get an ulcer all right 
Am I going too far with this? Perhaps I am in a sense, but be that as it may. You can't take it. Your mind can do the same thing. If you have an intake too much of one thing or certain things that are bad for you, you get an ulcer of the brain. And that affects the spirit, for your mind is the intellect of your soul. And you've got trouble. So, I want you to realize there is a fasting that is more important to you even than the fasting of your tummy. It is to keep the mouth of your mind closed to espousing certain things until you have considered them beyond all means. But most of all, and foremost, I should say, is to recognize, to have the ability to recognize what is your father's and what is not. To be able to, to uh, separate the sun and the moon. Oh, well, anybody knows that the sun shines in the daytime and the moon's at night. How can they confuse that? What light do you look upon when you look upon the moon, my dear friend? You're looking at the light of the sun. It's a reflection. It's a mirror image. And you'd better be able to discern between imagery. The real and the fake. The real fruit and the false fruit. So we're going to look a little deeper into what kind of fasting you must do to be able to remove uh, those demonics of the moon, which is only a reflection of the real thing. You have the real Christ. You have the real Son. You have the imitator would-be Christ, and you have the reflection of that Son, which is to say the moon. And his children have that terrible, that awful disease, lunacy. And those that absorb in their minds the, the data that they spew forth by the reams in these end times and put it to bed in their minds, you cannot reason with them. You cannot touch them. For they have set, precise, prejudged ways. And though God has given them a mind that has doors that open in 360 degree circles uh, to take in new information, they have closed them. and have blinded themselves to seeing what actually happens in this earth, earth through God's Word and sealed their ears to hearing what God would say to us from His Word. So, fasting means more than what this naturally... We can't blame our little flesh bodies. Whenever we say fasting, you're automatically going to think of food and don't worry about it. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. And you're not going to cast any demons out just because you've gone on a little hunger strike. You must understand your Father's Word to draw the power that He would place in your mind from His Word. Let's go this time to... Let's go to... Let's go to Matthew. Let's, let's, let's listen to Jesus' words in that 17th chapter of Matthew. We have observed where Joseph was a type of that Savior and the vision that was given him concerning deliverance. Let us now go to the Savior of Savior, Joshua Messiah, and his words. Uh, chapter 17, let's go ahead and start with verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came a, to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic. It's important that you not note, he didn't say that he was demon-possessed. It said lunatic, for this is the kind we're talking about. And that's what Jesus wanted to draw your attention to that. Lunatic, from the word lunar. 
He's moonstruck, is what the word actually means in the Greek. And sore vexed. He suffers a great deal. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. Satan has him in his chains. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. You understand? They could not cure him. Do you know why his disciples couldn't cure him? Do you know what one of the primes of disciple is? It's discipline. They had not disciplined themselves in the Word of God. They had disciplined themselves for their little tummy. Not what God really wanted them to discipline themselves in, whereby the blessings of God flow. They thought they had, but they had not gone to the deeper level of fasting. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless uh, and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. How much longer am I going to be here to teach you? Disciple means pupil also, and he disciplines his pupils. And Jesus rebuked the devil. Therefore, we know there was a devil involved naturally. And he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Instantly. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? The question that you'll hear many people ask, they may not come right out and ask it. Sometimes it will be asked in what I call a statement of little faith. Do you know where I'm coming from? Why couldn't we do it? I wonder, I suppose, I think, I guess, it was God, uh, maybe God was on vacation. You might as well go ahead and say. I guess God was on vacation. Is why we couldn't do it. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. Now, if you want to know what fasting does for you, it strengthens your belief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, that means this nation, what nation? The Kenite nation. He's been teaching against from base one. The sons of Cain. The sons of who? The sons of Satan. That first food that was taken and desire filled in the garden. That's the nation he's talking about. Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. You understand? Do you know why when you come to full belief that there is, and this is true, it's a true statement, there is absolutely nothing impossible to you when you come to full faith today, right now, this instant. You don't have to make any excuses for miracles not happening, etc. Because if you come to full belief, and come near enough to our Father that you can begin to understand His plan, then you will believe, you will not join yourself with anyone else to believe anything other than God's plan. And I have to assure you, dear brethren, it's going to happen that way. You don't have to worry about it happening. It's going to happen His way. And if you're a true believer, you wouldn't want it to happen any other way. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why I believe, because if you love your Father, you will want his word to come to pass exactly it's written. You know why? Because until it does, our promises are not complete. All those beautiful, wonderful promises made are not completed until his plan happens exactly as it's written. So we can believe what he's saying in another way, if I may attack this from a little different angle. He's saying to you, if you will work on my team, you will be able to say, this mountain will move in the ocean because I'm going to move it. Uh, that's what God's telling you. There's a time and a place for everything. And when it's God's time, it's your time. When it's God's place, it's your place. You shouldn't want it any other way. Okay, 21. How be it? Now sharpen up for me. 
How be it this kind, underline it, kind, what kind? Lunatic. Goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Because you must understand the deeper ramifications of fasting as well as prayer. What is prayer? It's meditating with your Father. It's talking to your Father. It's listening to your Father through His Word, through the Spirit. And fasting on those things, He instructed you to fast upon. Fast means what? Close your mouth. Do not intake. For you see, when you intake that, or when you sustain yourself uh, from taking into your mind the filth of, and I'm, uh, uh, pornography is not the only filth that is poured out in this world. It's not going to hurt you as bad as some of this other stuff that's poured out and is called truth. Uh, some of that other stuff can have you worshiping the devil, the lunar. If you're not right real careful, it is the more damaging. Am I saying then that I approve of pornography? No. No. I enjoy God's nature. I enjoy the beauty of His children. He expects us to. But not, not to Satan's will and way. So, there's only one way. The disciples couldn't do it because they had not disciplined themselves in God's Word to understand the deeper meaning of fasting because they had been hungry too often. Their minds automatically zeroed up. Instead of marshals of thought wave for their consumption, 22. Well, okay, let's stop right there. Let's stop there. Turn with me to Matthew 24. There will be famine in the end times. You all know this 24th chapter of Matthew. It has to do, if you would, with the end of this earth age. Christ gave seven signs of exactly what would happen and transpire to... Uh, consummate the end of this age. That is to bring it the, the last month's years, the events that would happen. And he lists a happening. He states, first of all, take heed that no man deceive you in verse 4 of Matthew 24. There's going to be a lot of deception is what he's saying. Stuff that you'd better be fasting your mind away from. You know, First of all, let me make it very clear. It doesn't hurt for you to hear something. It's whether you digest it or not. It's whether you put it to bed or not. It's what's, you know, we have to be strong enough that we can listen to lunacy and smile about it or throw it aside or, or, or uh, cast it aside or whatever. Don't ever join any group that teaches that you must be afraid to hear this, that, or the other or go to this place, that place, or the other. We are God's children. This is His earth. We claim it. We can go anywhere we choose. Uh, I said choose. Use good judgment. Five. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And we shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. In other words, there's going to be a lot of people around saying Christ is here. You hear a lot of... This means... This would indicate like from a pulpit. Okay? The religious community... Many tell you that Christ is coming soon. There are very few churches that don't teach. Christ is coming very soon. Little children, listen to me. He's coming and He's going to gather you all back to Him and fly you away. That's taught from... This is on this day. I would say that in 98% of the churches in this nation... That is taught. They're going to be raptured away. That's lunacy. Absolute lunacy. And I love the brethren. I'm not. Can I go there? Should you stay away from there? Pray that you never have to. You don't have to worry about walking into a place where someone's teaching the rapture theory, unless it puts you on a guilt trip, and God moves upon you and 
encourages you to speak out, well, if you're a guest somewhere, then you're a rude guest if you do that. That's the wrong place and time to do it. Besides that, they'll throw you out. <laughs> so you have to use good judgment in all things is what I'm saying. But you don't have to be afraid of it, beloved. That's my point, okay? And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. What did that say? See that you are not troubled. Have you been fasting enough that you don't have to be troubled? Oh, I don't know. I still worry quite a bit. You're not fasting enough, friend. For when you fast and absorb that that is right, you know better than to be troubled. God's in control. Your Father is in control. And things are going to happen as He chooses they should happen. Of all these things, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. There you got it. You can underline it. Not maybe. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And so there shall be. If you have fasted as you should, you will know what kind of famine we're talking about. There won't be any problem to you. And then you're coming close to being able to knock on the door of that kind and say, hey, push it on out, buddy, in the power of he that I represent. Amos chapter 8, in conclusion. In the Minor Prophets, Amos chapter 8, Okay, we're going to cover this chapter pretty good because I want you to picture this generation. Chapter 8, let's just start with verse 1. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. Well, here we're going to eat again. Always food right there on the table. Amos chapter 8 in the Minor Prophets. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. This means first ripe, all right? First ripe fruit, ready to eat. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. They're ripe for chastisement. They're right to show the whole bunch of them just how stupid they can be. Okay? Remember the pulpits I was just speaking of? It's pretty bad, all right? It is very bad. The basket of the figs are ready for consumption, for chastisement. The end is at the door. The apostasy has come to pass all but de facto when the leader of the apostasy, the son of perdition, sets foot upon this earth. The basket is full and it is ripe. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. Where? In the temple. They shall cast them forth with silence. There's going to be a hush. You know why? They're spiritually dead. Absolutely spiritually dead. Even when they open their mouths to give great sermons, if they're given to that one of the Luna, they're given in vain. And they lead to death, not life. The same as the verse we started with in the garden. That one, through promising fruit and food and wisdom and enlightenment, brought death to Adam. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. You that think you're getting away with something, you'd better sharpen up. You know who he's talking to here the very seed of the serpent, saying, When will the new moon be gone? When is this holiday going to be passed so we can open the business doors again, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great? Do you know what that's called? Is that inflation, usury, 
You put a few, you know, ultimately, you got it. And falsifying the balances by deceit. Now, don't be one of these Christians that get your mind set totally on receiving a bad deal at the market. Okay? There's worse places to receive a bad deal than at the market. It's the temple. All right? You understand? Fasting. All right? The corn. You know what's going to happen if you partake of that corn? Listen. That we may buy the poor for silver. Now, we, we can take them into slavery with silver. With the monetary system, we can actually put them in bondage. Hey, they have. The young people today, as well as some of us that have a little grave mixed upon the, the, uh, the smokestack or whatever you want to call it. If we have trouble with those bills and so forth, you know, you work a lot, but sometimes paying interest. And that's why I encourage you, don't get caught up in that if you can help it. You save. Do your, pay interest to your own self. Save until you can afford to buy. And then you've got a good bargain. But any time you buy something, the only time you should really buy something using usury is to make money with. Okay? The only time you should ever borrow money is when it will make you money. Well, we have to have a car to get to work. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. You have to have your work as your income. But at the same time, if you're a businessman, don't borrow money for show necessarily. Borrow money only when it makes you money. And don't ever be afraid to get your feet wet, but be certain as a man or a woman of God, you're not going in over your ankles. All right? No, you're a winner. Don't take chances. That's what I'm saying. I mean, this is what you're walking into, friend, is what I'm telling you. If you don't take that advice, then you're going to walk into this. And I guarantee you it's loaded against you, all right? That we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the... We can sell them the old molded wheat. That's what you're going to be... Your famine will be brought to an end by, or your feasting is molded wheat. A bad deal. The Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, Remember Joseph that we started with, okay? Surely I will never forget any of their works. Not even little old Joseph thrown into the well. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein, and it shall rise up holy as a flood. It's coming, you can count on it. And it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. Every year when before they put up the Aswan Dam or whatever you call it, the old Nile would flood. It happened every year, year after year. And they were a lot better off then too because that fertilized their soil. And it came to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, it shall come to pass. In that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon. We're seeing something very unusual here, all right? And I will darken the earth in the clear day. There's not going to be a moon up there at this time to mislead, all right? To give any false image. And I will turn your feasts. These great celebrations you use in your churches and temples into mourning. Remember them praying for the mountains to fall upon themselves in the book of Revelation. And your songs into lamination. Your great holy songs are going to be sad songs. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon your head. Do you know what that means? That's a Hebrew idiom that means shame. I'm going to make you ashamed. Can you imagine some high-powered television evangelist worshiping Satan and having to admit it to his flock? Friend, that is shame. And it's going to happen. It is going to happen. And I will make it as the morning of an morning, 
the sadness of, of and weeping for an only son. Make sure it's the right son, beloved. The end thereof as a bitter day. Because many will have mourned at that time. For they will have worshipped the wrong son. That's to say, he of the moon. Okay, verse 11, sharpen up for me. Behold, the days come. Now, did he say maybe? No. The days come saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. What was that last famine we read about in Matthew 24? The famine of the end time. That's it. This is that famine He will send. He couldn't have made it any clearer. Not a famine of bread. Aha! Now you're beginning to understand the fasting that you must do to be able to cast out that kind. We're not talking about bread. Do you remember when the disciples, in their great study, disciplined themselves to the point when they crossed over after feeding the multitude? Jesus said, don't you remember? He's getting on to us because we forgot to bring the crumbs of the bread. And Jesus said, I am not talking about bread. I am talking about the doctrine about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That kind, that kind of fasting, keep that junk out of your mind. Be able to discern between God's Word and Satan's Word. For your Heavenly Father, with all His love, has pre-warned you in His Word. Did Jesus not say in Matthew 24, Don't worry, I have foretold you all things. Don't be troubled, dear one. Your Father has foretold you all things. The famine of the end times is not for bread, but what? It's not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, not something to drink, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That's what the famine is for of hearing words of someone other than the Lord. So when you fast, let your mouth be closed and, and abstain. As far as putting to bed in the seat of your mind any thoughts that do not belong there as fact, do not let the traditions of man limit your ability to take in as a whole God's Word and His teachings to go into the depth of what a true fasting is about. A fasting of knowing God's Word when you hear it, gaining power and strength from that Word, and then not to hear only, but to do. To exercise it, to put it to use. To use the power. If something negative happens in your life, you can handle that kind. It's no step for a stepper. Put it out. Order it out. Use uh, the strength and the power that you have gained from the prayer and the fasting of Almighty God. The fasting He instructed you to take hold of. Don't you dare partake of that fruit that Satan shoves in front of you Though you feel you're starving for hearing new truth, uh, new knowledge, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there is no new knowledge. That that we call new knowledge is only man's catching up a little bit with the knowledge that our Father put before us many, many moons ago. How weak and fragile we are. How frail. Our little minds where we try to ascertain the deeper things of God. And until He touches us with His Spirit and begins to unfurl His beautiful words and truths from Genesis through the book of Revelation, 
how simple, how simple it was. And do you know something? It was there all the time. Man must catch up, and may our Father, when we fast, and as I said, there's nothing wrong with fasting for food as well. It gives the stomach a rest. But bless your hearts, you fast yourself away from the doctrine of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the scribes, the hypocrites, and have a peaceful day. Don't let them trouble you. Grow wise enough in his word that you can say, My father controls this world. My father owns this world. I'm his child. I'm protected. I'm special. In his eyes, I am. I'm not any more special than any other child he's got. He loves them all, and I think that's beautiful. But I don't have to worry, because my father is in control. I know that when it comes to the meal tomorrow, he's going to have it there. It's going to be there. And if I have to miss one, it's not going to hurt me. Because you see, my father and I, we own it all anyway. So that's the least of my worries, is my father providing here. But my worries and my, ma my main worry, if I had a worry, and probably it would be better to, terminate, to, um, to describe it as sorrow, maybe my greatest sorrow, is when I look at our brethren today, that I love so dearly because my father loves them. Your father loves them. They're misled. They don't know how to fast. They don't know and have, been, have become a part of that great famine. That great famine that is the lack of hearing God's truth. God's word. Oh, they hear a lot of men's words they are bombarded with men's words. But I hope you noted that it said that famine is for hearing God's Word. That's your Father. And though we may be in the flesh now, and though we are in a room in northwest Arkansas, there is a time coming soon. And the body that you are now in is a mass that reaches around this globe. It's the children of the living God. And he's returning soon. For you see, what we have studied this morning is not only fact, it's a reality. An absolute reality that you can put to bed in your mind and claim it, for it is your victory. And you are a child of God. And I praise Him for that. Let us continue to seek the in-depth knowledge and truth of God's Word. But most of all, let us utilize that that He has given us to share with the world. Whereby, when all is said and done and that day comes, that the famine that was upon the world was not our fault. That we had passed that word and they had heard and our hands were clean. Remember Ezekiel chapter 3. Else you teach it. Else you tell them. And they still are deceived. It's your fault. The magnificent tools that he has given us. May we as a family, as we go into this new year, Exercise that right with joy and love for each and every one that is hungry to hear that word and is fasting, staying away from the traditions of the scribes and the Pharisees. What a privilege. And our family, whether they're here in this building and whether they participate by taking hold of that camera or whether they support that they maybe take care of the bigger part and that is to help pay for that thing that sits up there whereby the people can hear we're all one in that 
And what a wonderful time. And we're troubled because we may get a snow bath at 8 p.m. <laughs> in cleaning the dish off. Heavens no. Thank God we have the dish. And we just thank our Father for that. Well, perhaps I'm digressing a little bit on such a beautiful truth from our Father's Word, but I hope you'll allow me that. I want you to be foolish a moment. I, I love you all so much for your for yourself. Just putting forth that food that destroys Satan's famine of the end times. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. Oh, Father, how blessed that you touched our ears and that we could hear. Help us to grow stronger in thy truth, Father, that we may, as mortal men, see deeper, Father, into your truth. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that opens our minds to your truth. Father, we just ask you that you be with this family throughout this universe, Father, this globe, in these end times. Touch them, and we look forward to this year. In the precious name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, amen.